done today. We're continuing forward. This is week four in a series called Armed, Engaging in Spiritual Battle Together. And so we continue in that. If you have a Bible, you might want to find your way to Ephesians chapter six. If you either printed up notes before, which means you are incredibly well organized, or if you're like me, I actually kind of like taking them on my phone. You can open up our app and go to resources and you'll see a place for sermon notes and find today's date. And you can track with us along that way as well. Here's the the situation. The impetus for this series is asking the question, who is your enemy? Who is your enemy? Not only like Jared said earlier today, do we live in just such a unique season, but we live in a very divided season. And so the question is, is my enemy that other political party? Is my enemy protesters? Is my enemy the police? Is my enemy a group of people that are just doing things so differently than I want them done? Is my enemy a person here at church who thinks differently than I do? And what we've seen as we've begun walking through this chapter in Ephesians 6 together is that no other person truly at the end of the day is my enemy. Everyone made in the image of God, an image bearer of God, though they may be working for him, they're not. And the reality is what this series has bubbled to the top, what can be so misleading and confusing is that our one true enemy, it said we read a couple weeks ago, we don't struggle, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the devil and his network, his demonic network. And so we're trying to heighten that during this series so we can get our eyes up and we can see what is going on, what really is taking place around us that we need to pay attention to so we can engage spiritual battle with spiritual armor. That's really been the point of everything that we've been after. So our one true enemy is God's enemy, Satan himself. And what we're looking at week by week is realizing God has given us resources. He's given us armor so that we can engage in spiritual battle in a spiritual way. And so we're excited that you're joining us today to continue on in that series. Today, we're looking at another piece of armor, this idea of righteousness, and it's described or likened to that of a breastplate that was meant to protect your thorax. I promise I'll explain that in just a second. So if you looked up at me, why are we talking about thoraxes? I'll tell you in just a second. Look at our now what statement in your notes or on the screen. Oppose the enemy by standing together in the righteousness of Jesus and by living rightly towards God and others. Oppose the enemy is our idea as we walk away this week by standing together in the righteousness of Jesus and by living rightly towards God and others. If you're taking notes with us today, number one in your notes, the righteousness of God protects what is most vital to you. The righteousness of God protects what is most vital to you. We're in Ephesians chapter six, beginning of verse 13. Therefore, Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Hilke did a great job last week beginning this new part of the series, kind of looking at one of these uh, elements, one of these pieces of armor a week. And we looked at the idea of truth and it was likened to that of a belt, the idea that that which holds everything in place. And he walked that out with us really well. I hope your, my home group had a great conversation this last week discussing that idea of truth together. And like we've said in this passage, every verb that we're going to read, whenever it's kind of understood as you, it's y'all. Every verb is a second person plural. So this is really important that this passage isn't written to you individually. We are not an army of individual soldiers isolated from one another. Instead, it's written to us the people of God, the army of God. And that's why every single thing that we look at, I wanna say this and we'll say it every week, every piece of armor that we look at, not only like Hilke said is non-negotiable because when God says, put on the full armor of God, there's not a piece that we should look down upon and say, well, that one's not quite as important or that one doesn't serve as important of a purpose. The full armor of God, but not only is that important for you, to engage in spiritual battle, it's important for us. Meaning as we are an army walking together, 
in, in this attitude of going, God, we are your people called to live your way in this season, it's not only important that you are wearing this belt of truth, but that I am as well. Not just for me, but for you. Because that's this interdependence that we're gonna see all throughout this passage, that it's essential that we wear the full armor of God, not just you as an individual or me as an individual. So suiting up together is gonna be essential. And that's what we've talked about in this series, the absolute need for our unity, because division will isolate us from one another when we need each other so desperately for so many things, including spiritual battle. I told you a couple weeks ago that I was going to want to recommend more than one book in this series. Some of you already have told me that you've either picked up a new or for the first time C.S. Lewis's classic, The Screwtape Letters. And that's such a great read and such a great reminder of the devil's schemes, what he's after. We said that book's written almost 80 years ago and it absolutely rings true for the issues that we're still facing today. Not much has changed. But a second book I wanted to let you know about that I think you would really appreciate is this book called Spiritual Warfare in the Storyline of Scripture. It's written by two seminary professors. I think it's masterfully done. And what it basically talks about is the first half is probably written by a guy who teaches Old Testament or New Testament, just kind of survey or, or an overview. And what he does is he goes through the entire Bible and raises to the top, these are the places where spiritual battle is happening. Sometimes it's obvious Satan is named, other times it's not. And so he's just gonna give you an overview when you look over scripture, these are the places where spiritual battle is happening. So that's a great read. The second half is written by another professor at the same seminary who does a lot of things with spiritual formation and he talks about this is what that means in your life today. This is what that means in the local church. So it makes it very practical on the second half. And I just, I've only started it, but I tell you from everything I've read, I really appreciate it. Here's a quote I wanted to give you today under the section called the enemy strategy against the local church. Again, reiterating this need for our unity. It says, division reflects both the wickedness of the human heart and the work of the enemy, who knows that people who metaphorically shoot each other in the back are not likely to live in much victory. He is slick enough to know that division turns a church inward, creates bitterness, and even destroys Christian friendships. It's no wonder then that Jesus taught his followers to pray for unity there in John 17 as a witness to the world. So let's, I wanna do something today. I, I told Bill earlier this week, I'm a youth pastor at heart. I'll probably never grow out of that. I wanna give you a moment. I want you to stand up for me. Would you just take a minute to stand? If you can, if you're not able to, don't move, okay? We'll come to you. I want you to stand up. Here's what I want you to do in a socially distant way. I want you to go find someone and stand opposite them. Just do it. Go find someone, stand opposite them. If they're not standing up, go to them, okay? You gotta move around a little bit. Move around the cabin. Find someone in a socially distant way. And here's what I want you to do. I'm gonna say it all and then I'm gonna lead you in how to repeat this. If we have to have a group of three, that's okay. Sometimes our math might not work out where it's just one-on-one, -on -one, but join a group of three. Here's what I want you to do. I'm gonna say it all and then I'll have you say it to one another. It goes this way. We're on the same team. I love you even if we don't agree on everything. Okay, can you look at each other? We'll say a phrase at a time. Let's start with the beginning. We're on the same team. I love you, even if we don't agree on everything. Good, go find someone else. Mix it up. Go find someone else. We got folks up here that need some people to come over and see them. Here they come, they're on their way. Good. Can I join your group of three? Hey, do you want to turn my mic off so it doesn't get crazy just for a second? All right, one more time. We're going to do it again. Find someone new. You're looking at them. Let's say it one phrase at a time. Lane, would you come over? These folks over here are looking for someone to talk to them. All right, first phrase. We're on the same team. I love you, even if we don't agree on everything. Awesome. One more time. Go find someone new. Someone you haven't talked to yet. Hey, Scott, would you come over here? I won't move again. I, bad idea. Sorry, Greg. Greg's like, Todd, come on. 
All right, one more time. Let's say it together. We're on the same team. I love you, even if we don't agree on everything. Good job. Go find your seat. Good job. Those of you guys on, at home watching online, I didn't give you better instructions. My hope is that you might be with someone. And if you did, you at least turned to them and said that a time or two. How absolutely crucial in this age, when it's so easy to divide, we've got to remember there are a lot of big rocks that we share in common. And as the church, it's not negotiable that we be united. All right, thank you for indulging me. Hilke reminded us last week that this idea of truth is not again something that I can or cannot engage in my life, it's essential. And we're talking about righteousness today and righteousness, like every other quality, is the same way. It isn't negotiable, it's not, it's a, a, an essential item in our armor to put on the full armor. So let me show you a picture, if you can see on screen, this is what a breastplate was in the first century. And let me give you a definition as you're kind of looking at that. First off, by the way, the Greek word for this, oh, let's go back one more step. Yeah, so you can kind of see it in the middle. It's kind of this thing of metal on front and back. And the Greek word to describe that item, thorax. That was a thorax. That's what that was. And so you get that, that we get our English word thorax from the same. And it basically meant this coat of mail, this idea of, of armor. And this is the definition. This piece of armor made of metal plates or chains covered the body from the neck to the waist, both front and back. It symbolized the believer's righteousness in Christ. We'll look at this later today, 2 Corinthians 5, as well as his righteous life in Christ, Ephesians 4. So its purpose was to protect the soldier's vital organs that are located in your chest, in your thorax. And the reality is, is that an injury to your heart an injury to your lungs, an injury to your kidneys, your spleen, your intestines, all the things that are in here would prove lethal. Therefore, it needs armament. Here's the point. Kevlar was not developed for your elbow. When someone wears a bulletproof vest, they wear it in the same exact place, protecting vital organs. So that's another way to think of a breastplate is the similar space where a bulletproof vest would go. So what is a, if that's what a breastplate was in the passage that we're looking at, what does the Bible mean when it uses the word righteousness? I find that righteousness is what I call a Bible land word, meaning you don't use it anywhere else but church. So we have to define the terms. Some of you would be familiar. How many of you would remember in the 60s a group called the Righteous Brothers? You remember them, right? And they were uh, Unchained Melody, You've Lost That Loving Feeling, great songs, okay? It doesn't mean them, okay? Some of you are a child of the 80s, a little bit more like me, and you might remember the absolutely epic line from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. They think he's a righteous dude, okay? Also not what Paul's talking about, okay, was Ferris Bueller. So this word, let's break it down. I'm not gonna attempt to um, kind of uh, pronounce this Greek word, but you can see it on the screen. But this is what it means. It means the approval of God. That which is deemed right by the Lord, what is approved in his eyes. I like to break down, and I'll use it this way a lot today, the word righteous to simply mean what is right. Defined by God, not by me. Defined by God, that which is right. And we'll talk about today that this rightness from God relates to both a vertical reality, being in a right relationship with him, as well as horizontally with each other, being right, re rightly related to one another. So if that's an easy way to remember it, I think it's a great way to remember it today, that it means the idea of being right, right with God, right with others. And because God is, the essence of God is righteous, he acts in ways that are completely consistent with what he approves of. And it relates to the character of God in that we exhibit this towards others and it might be defined with terms like integrity, virtue, purity of life, or uprightness. So as we saw a little bit from the quote I mentioned from Wearsby a minute ago, and as we'll look together, I want you to see this in your notes. We're gonna look at righteousness kind of through two lenses today. For the Jesus follower, righteousness is to be understood as positional, as positional in Christ, as well as practiced because of Christ. 
Righteousness is to be understood. When we talk about put on the, the breastplate of righteousness, we mean a positional reality in Christ and something that we practice because we're in, of Christ and now that we're new in him. Uh, check out this uh, chart, by the way, if you might be able to see it. This chart is in the book I just mentioned a minute ago, and it breaks down each of these um, six pieces of armor in a similar way. So you'd see our position in Christ. Jesus gives us his righteousness, and our practice in life is that we are to live righteously, ever forsaking sin. So we're going to see both of those kind of quadrants today, what it means to be rightly related to God ver uh, vertically and rightly related to each other horizontally. So look at number two in your notes today. The rightness of Jesus, the rightness of Jesus enables us to stand against the enemy together. The rightness of Jesus enables this. If you have a Bible, you wanna flip over to Romans three. We're gonna be in Romans three and Romans four today. Romans three, this is powerful. This is how it begins in verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. There's the word again, the righteousness, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Verse 25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Look at this line. He did this to demonstrate what? His righteousness. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand and punished. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So we're going to look at two consecutive chapters today defining or expressing this idea of righteousness, Romans 3 and then Romans 4. And we're going to talk about first this idea of this positional righteousness because of what Jesus accomplished for you. So it's the culmination of this amazing, when you read the book of Romans, and if you have any kind of interest in just building a case... This is what he's doing, Romans 1 through 3. And this is the culmination of that case that every human being stands universally before God as sinful and deserving of judgment. Like we just read, there is no difference. It doesn't matter who you are. You stand before God as condemned because of your sin. And that's what Jesus' sacrifice of atonement that's what Paul mentions there, this turning away of the wrath of God. That's what that word atonement means, to turn back the wrath. That's received by faith. That's the only way that we can escape such a judgment and be made positionally or legally right with God. No longer condemned, but now justified. Can I get a yay God this morning? You see, that's great news. You and I had no hope apart from what Jesus did on our behalf. There was no way you could ever be right before a holy God, a righteous God, if Jesus didn't do something in your stead. That's why when we talk about the gospel, we're always talking about a reality of both God's goodness, but also human humility. I've talked to too many religious people who are trying to do something to earn righteousness from God and who simply won't begin the equation with, God, there's nothing I can do to be right with you. But I'm so grateful Jesus did it all for me. That's where it begins. That's how the gospel begins. And so in this idea, this is what we talk about, this positional righteousness. And you'll note that twice in the passage, it said, God did this. This refers to providing Jesus as the atoning sacrifice for sin. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, meaning God isn't just righteous, he shows it. He lives it, he demonstrates it. So consistent with his own character that is righteous, he demonstrated consistency towards those in the past as well as those in the present. He never minimizes, he never tolerates sin. You need to know that today. We live in a culture where we don't like to talk about sin very much. And we've really minimized the reality of not only what that means, destroying a relationship with God, but also destroying relationships with one another. God never minimized sin to make you right. 
we can easily forget that. Hilke said last week that Paul might have been thinking about this belt of truth, looking at the Roman centurion that he was shackled to. But he also said Paul also might have been remembering passages in the prophet Isaiah, when Isaiah writes about Messiah arming himself to wage war against sin. Here's another place that's true from Isaiah 59. Truth is nowhere to be found, and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. Look at this sentence. The Lord looked and was displeased. Why? That there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So as a result, his own arm achieved salvation for him. Watch, and his own righteousness sustained him. Look what he did. Verse 17 of Isaiah 59. He put on righteousness as his breastplate. Same, same term used in Ephesians 6. And the helmet of salvation on his head. We'll see that in a couple weeks. Same term in Ephesians 6. And he put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. According to what they had done, so he will repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. I would hate for you to walk away today thinking that God has somehow minimized sin because of the gospel. In no way. And if you're hearing me say those words about God arming himself to go to battle against those who are wicked, if you are not on God's side because of responding to the gospel, those words should terrify you. And rightly so, they're meant to. They're meant to remind you that in God's righteousness, he will indeed punish evil now and forever But that's why Paul says there really is great news. The great news of the gospel is that you and I escape that wrath, escape that judgment when we're positionally found in what Jesus has done in our place. There's a wonderful truth about this approach of God in the Bible. It's in your notes. God punishes sin, but at the cross, he punished his son for your sin. Don't ever forget that. God punishes sin. That's not the issue. But he punished his son for your sin. That's where it happened. That's where this great exchange. Maybe you've heard the illustration before of a judge who sits in this place of of rightness and he condemns the criminal correctly. But rather than the criminal having to wear, having to bear the penalty, he offers his son in his place. The criminal is found as such, but the penalty is engaged by someone else. That's the gospel. That's what Jesus has done for you, what he's done for me. This line that we read in Romans 3, so as to be just, God never lets go of his justice and yet the one who justifies. That that line in and of itself is so beautiful. God never lets go of his righteousness but he also provides a sacrifice in your place. You become righteous because of what Jesus has done. This hymn that we sing often, I love this line. I tell it to Bill and Chris all the time. Anytime we can sing before the throne of God, please. Because the sinless savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God, the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me. This is why this is such amazing news that we have been, here's the thing I want you to walk away with today. You have been made right with God because Jesus was made wrong for you. Not a great truth. You have been made right with God because Jesus was made wrong for you. That's what the Bible succinctly says in 2 Corinthians 5. It's on the screen. God made him who had no sin to be sin, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Don't lose that. It isn't just that God, that Jesus was penalized, that he bore the reality of punishment for you. Catch also, as a result, you're made right. You're not just kind of a blank slate. You're actually seen as right in the eyes of God because you're in Christ. 
It's a powerful reality and that's what we're talking about. So here's the question. Why is that so important about what we're talking about today? If that's what it means to be positionally right with God because of Jesus's atoning work at the cross, that you were made right because he was made wrong, why is that so important as far as a piece of armor that we would wear on ourselves? And can I simply remind you of what you already know? You have an enemy who would absolutely love for you to forget that. You have an enemy who would love to have you live as though that isn't true. Especially on the days when you blow it. Especially on the days when you obviously so clearly sin against God. You do it all the time, but there's days you really do it. Days when you sin against those in your household, those you love, those you do life with, and you go, God, I can't believe I did that again. When we blow it, sometimes we'll come to a place wondering, God, can you even forgive that? God, is there something in me that is unredeemable? And I wanna tell you today, if that you're here today and you're in Christ, you have responded to the gospel in faith. Remember the word that Paul uses in Ephesians 6 is the word diabolos, the slanderer, the one who wants to condemn by severing relationship. You see, this is so important because Satan wants you to forget what Jesus did in your place and that you can and are be right with him. So in your notes, it's important that you consciously remember This is part of the armament of God. It's important that you consciously remember that you're redeemed and no longer seen as condemned, but as justified by the justifier. It's important that you consciously remind yourself. By the way, it's important that we consciously remind each other. Hey, I know that you blew it. Think about this. How different would this be when we sin towards one another? And when we're aware enough to say, not only did I do that, but I need to come to you and ask for forgiveness. And what about when you are, someone asks you, would you please forgive me? And you tell them not only yes, and I do that because of what I've been forgiven, but you remind them and you are no less loved by God because of what you did to me. That's how we wear the breastplate of righteousness, not only vertically towards God, but to each other. Reminding ourselves, reminding one another that it's Jesus who's made us right before the Father. This isn't a license to sin, nor is it a thoughtlessness about my impact of sin on, towards God and towards others. But it's essential that you stay consciously aware of the fact that though the verdict is guilty, The penalty has been paid in full and you are free to walk in faith because you're right with God because you're in Christ. Yay, God. Yay, God. Number three in your notes, living rightly towards God and others enables us to stand against the enemy together. Living rightly towards God and others enables us to stand against the enemy together. The very next chapter, Romans 4, verse 1. What then shall we say about Abraham? our forefather according to the flesh. What did he discover in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. Verse five, however, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, what he's just said in Romans three, their faith, is credited as righteousness. So think of it this way, if in the courtroom, the judge has found you guilty, but yet provided his son to take the penalty of your sin, you are free to go. When you walk out of the courtroom is now this next point, is how do you treat the people that you do life with? Are you living in a way that demonstrates that same character that has rightly, has in his righteousness still done, been kind and gracious, even though he's never let go of his righteousness, do we then begin to live out that same capacity towards one another? And how we do it, Abraham's example, we do it by faith. 
We do it by trusting that even though everything inside of me says, this isn't a good idea, this isn't worth it, I lose when I treat people this way. By faith, we believe that's what we ought to do. See, the context of Abraham believing God in Ephesians 4 comes from Genesis 15. When God comes to a man who's married, his name is Abram, his name means father, he has no kids, it's kind of a joke. It's an incredibly sarcastic, hurtful joke. This guy, old age, no kids. He's afraid he's not gonna have anyone to pass off his legacy to. God tells that old guy, I'm actually gonna make you into the father of a nation. Look in the sky, you can't count how many are going to come from you. He also says to this resident alien, the ground you're standing upon will be your people's land. Abram had no capacity to believe anything of what God told him. There was no evidence to say, well, we've been trying for a long time, God, there's no kid. This land I live in doesn't look anything like mine any more than it did yesterday. There was no evidence compelling him to believe that what God said would happen. But what did we read in Romans 4? But Abraham believed God and it was credited as righteousness. I want you to hear today that that believing God is not just kind of theoretical pie in the sky. Abraham believed God and he just kind of like said, God, okay, this has been a really great moment. And then just went on his way the next day and sat on the couch and hoped God was gonna make good. There were things that Abraham did out of obedience to God, out of faith in God's promises that ultimately created a way for God to do exactly what he said he would do in every degree. Let me give you some, God hasn't made those promises to you, but he has said some things with great clarity. Forgive the person who's wronged you Everything in your flesh wants to harbor bitterness and resentment, but the righteousness of God demonstrated in scripture directs you to forgive as God forgave you. So I want you to see that today. That's a righteous decision when the seeming evidence around you says do different. Be honest with others when you fail them. In your flesh, you wanna hide. In your flesh, you wanna make excuses. In your flesh, you wanna blame others. But the righteousness of God demonstrated in scripture directs you to be truthful towards others around you. That's a righteous decision when the seeming evidence around you says do otherwise. Repent of devaluing others that you have looked down upon for whatever reason. Your flesh wants to justify your lack of loving others, but the righteousness of God demonstrated in scripture directs you to love all people because they're all image bearers of God. That's a righteous decision when the seeming evidence around you says do otherwise. And when you will choose to live righteously now in this horizontal plane, both vertically towards God and horizontally to each other, valuing his word as the source of your authority and transformation in your life, then you'll be arming yourself with righteousness, not allowing the enemy to profit from your sinful living vertically towards God or horizontally towards others. That's what Peter communicated to his readers. First Peter chapter two, he quotes, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, watch, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. Commentator Peter O'Brien, by putting on God's righteousness, believers are committed to being imitators of him from Ephesians 5 and acting righteously in all their dealings. So embrace the practices of Abraham that he believed God. He acted in accordance with what God told him. And as we live righteously towards God and others, we'll silence the power of the enemy among our ranks. Our now what statement that we started with today, oppose the enemy by standing together in the righteousness of Jesus and by living rightly towards God and others. In this series, what we've done at the end of every message is we've given you a time to pause, a time to consider that now what statement a time to prayerfully ask God, God, this week, would you give me the grace and the strength to live this out? 
We're gonna give you that space right now. And in a moment, the band's gonna call us back together with one last song.